And now a message from our sponsor. Hey everybody, it's Bootleg Captain, Captain Bootlegs here. If you're like me, I bet you're enjoying this Toys on Tap podcast. I am enjoying it. It's very nice. But did you know you can enjoy it more just by joining that Patreon? Oh, I did not know that. There are so many cool perks available on the Patreon for you. There's and also and and wow, that's really a lot of stuff if you ask Bootleg Captain. Captain I don't bootleg. understand. There were noises I couldn't hear with the perks. So join today to support Toys on Tap podcast and Bootleg Art Toys. But if you're not in a position to join the Patreon, head on over to Apple iTunes and review and subscribe. That helps out the channel as well. Okay, I'll go rate it, I guess. And remember, listen to Toys, Toys on, on Tap. Tap. Captain Bootleg, the bootleg captain sent you. Why did he keep referring to himself in the third Can person? I stop with the stupid voice now? I'm not sure why you made me want to sound like a pirate. Oh, so that was a fake voice. Oh, yucko! I, was doing. I didn't realize it was just a pretend voice. Oh. going through the Goldbergs and your episode just came up which was fun really interesting okay yeah well that's a good place to start I mean I did kind of want to talk about like the TV shit Mm -hmm. because that's kind of played a pretty significant role in like how all this shit is unfolded yeah and uh and I'm still living you know in the ripple effects of you know some of those endeavors I think like just again just to like just to give it some context to just like roll, roll back, roll back the timeline a little bit. Yep. And just talk about how I have been on and off of television since I was like four, you know, like I remember the first time I was ever on TV, I was like four years old. And this is, we were living in the West village with my family and we used to watch PBS a lot. It was into, Mm. you know, Sesame street, uh, Mr. Rogers, all of that shit. And there were a lot of these shows in like the early 70s, like Free to Be You and Me and all these like things where it was just like all these very sort of hippie or like post hippie, like sort of like hippies with families and kids doing in ecological stuff. I don't think they called it environmentalism at the time. They called it like ecology or whatever. Mm. And we lived in the West Village and there was this recycling center, you know, this is when like the recycling movement started to get going. And there was this little block with no buildings on it where people would dump their recycling. And this feels like it's in another planet at this point, but like people who lived in the neighborhood would just volunteer to go and work there for nothing, you know? Yeah. So that's what we did. Everyone in my building, we lived in this co-op building with a bunch of young families and on Saturday and Sunday, we would go down there and bail up newspapers and crush cans. And they had these metal boxes that you would get in and you'd have the safety equipment on and it'd be filled with glass and you'd have to smash all the glass <laughs> for some fucking reason. Like they had the one for the green glass, the brown glass and the clear glass. And this wasn't really for the kids. This is like the, the grownups would go in there and just smash glass bottles. And then have those all shit. I don't know what the fuck was going on. But anyway, one of these little hippie TV shows that was on Channel 13 was filming there. Yeah. You know, and I was excited with the prospect that I'd get on television. And uh, so they came for the day and I would do little things. I was four. What could I really do? But, but I would like help with the newspapers and carrying things around. And I don't remember they were filming all day. And I was like, wow, I'm going to be a TV star, you know? And then the show finally came on and I was on it for like one second, you know, mm-hmm. as just like a piece of B-roll. And I was livid. I was fucking livid. You know, I didn't like I really thought that like it was going to be about me for some reason, you know, and then they were going to give me more action. But, you know, I don't know. I guess at that from that point, you know, from that point, it was just always getting on TV was just something that happened to people, yeah. you know. And a few years later, you know, uh, in 1980, I had my other, my second appearance on television was when we went to go see Empire Strikes Back mm-hmm. on the opening day. Um, and this is like, you, we went at, at, people had been lining up at 4.30 in the morning, which was outrageous at the time. Yeah. That anyone would do that. Yeah, because that's, that's crazy. Because I've seen scenes and clips and stuff where people like, it was just so mind blowing that that was the first time people had ever seen others do that. Right. 
I think so. I mean, there yeah. was like one guy dressed as Darth Vader there. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, this is where you had to actually line up and buy the fucking ticket, mm -hmm. you know. And people started lining up at four in the morning. Uh, my mom took me out of school that day mm -hmm. and, um, and a couple of my classmates. And we went up to, to Lowe's Astor Plaza on 40, 44th Street, I think that was, where, where, where I saw the original Star Wars. And she somehow finagled somebody to let us cut ahead on the line, you know? So she cut the line with like me and her, me and about four, four or five other kids. And the news people were there, you know, covering this spectacle, you know, this shit is on my website and on my YouTube page. And they were like looking for people to talk to. So I screamed out, I saw Star Wars 21 and a half times, you know? And they wanted to talk to me. And so they stuck the microphone in my face and they asked me a bunch of questions. And I was on on the news for like maybe 30 seconds or whatever. But, yeah. you know, it was a pretty, pretty telling, pretty telling thing. Going and then, back real quick, going backwards. How did you find those clips to then use? Were they just you? Had oh, them? no, be, uh, I had them on VHS. OK, because we knew we knew what was coming on at, that night. So mm -hmm. we went home and just, you know, you that's what people used to do. They used to tape TV. Yeah. You know, if there was a show that you wanted to watch and you couldn't watch it at the time, you would record it onto a fucking VHS tape. So anytime I have a lot of weird shit from TV that I recorded back then, just because that's what you did. I mean, <clears throat> all the all the weird Manhattan cable stuff, all the mm -hmm. porn shows, I would record those things. So, yeah, I had them on VHS tape and I just I uh, that I recorded myself and I digitized them. And then <clears throat> not a whole lot of shit happened after that. And then uh, jump ahead to like 1997, right? And I'm back in New York, hanging around, just uh, doing dumb shit and partying. And, <clears throat> you know, everybody's hustling, right? So some friend of a friend is like, yo, my friend is like here in the city uh, and she's ha the dating game is here mm. uh, recruiting they are looking to cast contestants for the dating game. I guess that's what they would do. They go from city to city and just have these open calls. And this person's friend is like, this person will make more money the more people that she can get to show up to this audition. So I was like, all right, fuck it, let's go. We were drinking and fucked up. You know, we just sort of, I just went there. I wasn't expecting anything. I didn't even give a shit. I just went there to help this person out. And, um, <clears throat> but I auditioned. It was just in this little office room and I got up there and I, I told the story of my mom's tit clamps, right? Just like they yeah. just, add, you know, they wanted something provocative and racy. So that was what yeah. I had available. So I told the story and, and I wound up getting cast on, getting cast, you know? So they flew me out to LA and I was on the dating game and they had me and it was so dumb because they had me talking about, they were like, like, it was like, and it was all racially segregated. You know, they had like, there was like they would shoot two each episode of the dating game had two different games. You mm -hmm. know, it would be first one would be like the men are be and it was all heterosexual. The men are behind the curtain and there's a woman picking. And then the second episode, the second scene would be like there's a man there and the three women are hidden. You know, mm -hmm. you know how the dating game works, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like basically you just ask questions of these three people you can't see. And then just based on the answers, you pick which one you want to go on a date with. So we were the white guys and then there was three black girls backstage, you know, for the next scene. So I was making time with one of them, you know, in the green room. Yeah. And then, you know, which is not relevant to the story really, but it was just kind of fun. But then um, we go up there and like each guy, it was so staged, like they, all the questions were pre predetermined mm -hmm. and they were like, there was like, the rockabilly guy who's all the questions were about his guitar and his hair gel and, and, and his car and, you know, his music and shit like that. And then there was the frat boy football idiot. And yeah. he was like, and they, and then I was like the degenerate sleaze guy, <laughs> you know? So, and they, we were coached to like play to that type. And yeah. so the questions were like nipple clamps, tongue Kung Fu, which is like Tantra yoga shit and um, porno movies and stuff like that. So I did my part. I have the I, I have this on my website too, and um, I didn't win. Thank God, the girl was not for me. But you know, I guess I was too much for her. But you know, whatever. 
I went how it went, but I was like, you're getting comfortable with this thing. You know, they flew me out there and, you know, I just like getting comfortable with this idea of just being on, on, on TV. So uh, a couple of years after that, in like 2000, was it 2004? I was so, so fucking broke. And I was just desperate for money. And I'm looking on Craigslist for mm -hmm. shit. And um, uh, I see this ad. I was looking at everything, creative jobs, uh, acting jobs, things like that. And there was a thing from like, are you a lovable loser that's having trouble with getting with, with your love life? You know, we're offering a thousand dollars, you know, to, uh, to be on this new show called beautiful losers. And, um, we're looking to, we're shooting a pilot and we're looking for uh, a, a subject. Mm -hmm. So I went to it. I went to meet these guys <clears throat> And I just did my thing and they picked me and they picked me to be on the show. And it basically the, this was a show that was, they were pitching, they had pitched it to VH1. VH1 was interested in it and they needed to make a pilot episode. Mm -hmm. So it was me and these, this production company. Um, and it's just like a makeover show. It's like a three act makeover show where it's like act one, they meet, you meet this sort of likable person that has a lot of issues. Yeah. And then they, <laughs> And then they figure out what the issues are from your attitude to your appearance to your habits. And they, and then the second act is they give you a makeover. And then the third act is you go on a date with somebody. So they came into my house and they saw the famous, this piss jar that I have, which is kind of famous. I still have the piss jar, by the way. And uh, I was thinking about making an NFT of it. And, um, you know, and they just captured my whole personality and you know i was a very curmudgeonly kind of angry guy at the time i was still living at my mom's house and i was just like eh, really tight and then they like and looked and my clothes were all gross and busted and everything like that and then the second act they got me some new clothes and gave me an attitude adjustment and like they put me in all these situations where i had to deal with women you know and the narrator is there off camera giving me giving coaching me through all of this stuff it's pretty fucking funny and then the third act i wound up going on a date with a girl that i saw in the in the new york post mm. that was like i was i i was in a band for a really long time and um this woman that i was in the band with was a dj and there was like a story in the new york post about um women djs downtown women djs of color you know and there was this one girl, this like Filipino chick named Jenny Doom. And I was like, oh, my God, who the fuck is that? She's so cute. So I had uh, had my had the director that the producers arrange a date with her, went on the date. And then that was the episode. And she actually wound up uh, scratching on a couple of songs on one of my records. And then it didn't work out. But show got some. They showed that shit to VH1. And on the strength of that episode, they were able to sell the show. And it went for one season and then it, then it got canceled. And then these people went on to create uh, love and hip hop mm -hmm. and, and <laughs> the rest is history on that. And, um, so there, and I got my thousand bucks. So I, ha and then it came on TV and for like a brief period of time, people would recognize me on the street because of it. And I got really, really hooked on that, mm -hmm. you know, really, really liked that shit. Well, a couple years later, um, um, we talked about this at the end of the last episode. I'm, I'm on the toilet looking at Twitter and they're having open calls for work of art, next great artist season two on Bravo TV, which for those who might not know, is just like a competition style reality show in the, in the same format as like Top Chef or Project Runway, where you get a bunch of contestants every week, you hit them with a challenge and then they do the challenge and you follow the drama and the process. And then at the end, some experts look at the results. Somebody wins and gets accolades and prizes and somebody loses and they get eliminated from the show. And I, I was like, I had already, I'd seen the first season of the show and I, I was like, I should have been on this. What the fuck? So when I saw, when I saw the, the audition, I immediately knew I was going to get on it. No problem. Like the, there was an open call at Brooklyn Museum. Uh, and 5,000 people showed up and then they had an open, yeah. And then it had an open call in Chicago and an open call in LA, which about the same amount of people. So 15,000 people showed up to fill like 10 spots. Yeah. And for not one second that I ever question 
that I would, I knew I would just knew I was going to get this. What was that in you that knew what, like, well, what because I'd that? already been on TV a couple of times and for whatever reason, I just seemed to work well on TV. Yeah. Like I'm a complete disaster on Tinder, but on television, like the best parts of me come through yeah. succinctly and people just seem to get it. And like, that's not a flex or anything. It was just like, I had had enough. I had already been on TV twice to realize that I had certain strengths in that area and that I figured in addition to that, I'm, my art is kind of interesting. And I mm. knew it wasn't even about the art. They weren't looking for great artists. They were looking for personalities yeah. that would, that would make the show work. And I think that's what gave me the advantage over everyone else there who was th thought that they were going there to sell themselves on the merits of their work, which wasn't that, that at all. But also the work was interesting and unique enough. And I was able to speak about it articulately, you know, in order to get it. So I'm waiting online for like five hours to get into this fucking thing. And finally you get into the Brooklyn museum and there's like all these tables, like there's like a couple of dozen of people interviewing the contestants. You have like seven minutes to sit down with this person, show them your portfolio and give them your shtick. So I sit down, I did the thing. Boom. I said what I had to say. I had a little book. I actually sold this book on one of my live auctions last earlier this year or last year it looked like shit the photo the photography was terrible and the printing was really bad someone paid a couple of hundred bucks because it was the work of art audition yeah. book so this the thing about being on tv that's so great is that it it just creates instant ephemera mm -hmm. that that you can sell so anyway i got and i got and then later that day i get the phone call we want you to come back for the second round, bring a piece of work and come back in a couple of days and you're going to, and some of the producers are going to be there. So I go back and Simone DePuri is there, who is a famous auctioneer from this house, um, auction house called, um, Phillips DePuri. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, do you know who he is? He's like, I know he's this auction house. Swiss guy and he's got this flair for, for, you know, gaveling and he's just you know very dashing and dapper and and he already it, i had the the whole ringer because he already knew who i was because mm. a few years prior to that this guy named steve Egan was was working there and they wanted to do toys because christie's had done a toy auction like the year prior in like 2007 yeah. or some 2008 and they wanted to get on that so they were just curating like toy art everything from like vintage you know, Japanese Godzilla kaiju shit to like contemporary stuff. And um, we interrupted this broadcast of Toys on Top to bring you this. Meanwhile, the galaxy of bootleg treasures. DOV2, we have an engine failure. We almost crash land on DKE Toy Planet. Oh my, we're doomed. Wait, salvation. Hooray, we're saved, DOV2. Limited edition custom artist made action figures and DKE toys! Check out www.dkatoys.com for a full catalog. Hooray for custom action figures! DKE! He knew who I was. He bought one of the pieces that I had in his auction. It was like a DJ Stormtrooper. It was like a 12 inch, 1 6 scale, like Marmot Stormtrooper thing that I turned into a DJ. And he, he bought that. So he knew who I was. So I aced that second. Um, I aced that second interview no problem and then there was one final audition yeah and fifteen thousand people or five thousand uh second was how many people you they think probably it? cut it down to a few hundred okay so once you get into the, th the third it's like 10 20 50 people something like that and they flew me out to la and I just played them like a fucking cheap fiddle, man. <laughs> That's why I was sitting there and was like the main people from the, <laughs> the producers and China Chow was there and I knew I just I just knew what to say. And I and was just the but I kind of fucked myself in a way because right now at this moment I'm at the height of my bootleg figure supervillain celebrity. This mm -hmm. is like 2010, 2000, early 2011. And like I was unassailable at this time. My confidence was at an all-time high and everything was going great for me. And I had like fully matured into this persona that I had created. So it was just there. And I just, 
I had them wrapped around my finger and I presented myself that I was going to be the sort of antagonist of the show which they definitely wanted like rabble rousers and shit stirs. And I was like, I'm a diabolical supervillain. Yeah. You know? And so they cast me. And, but the thing is what the fucked me up is that that's hard to maintain, you know, when you're actually a good, decent person. So then we start filming the show Yeah, and it's, it's in New York city. And, uh, I was just like very prepared for it, you know, because I had, I just, I, I, I think what I went into this unlike anyone else because I for, I was going to make television. I wasn't going to make art. Mm-hmm. And that's what undid me ultimately. I was going to make television. And, you know, like I didn't want to meet any of the other contestants before the cameras started rolling. You know, they had this all in this holding room. And I was like, I, I hid behind the wall. I was like, you know, like, what's the point of meeting these people? Cause then when I meet them on camera, it's going to be fake, mm-hmm. you know, like we're going to, I don't want to do any acting here. Like I want this, this is reality TV. Let's make it real. And you know, they weren't, they, and uh, unlike the dating game, there was no coaching or anything like this company named magical elves was doing this show. And they're, they're one of the top, top like production companies for, for this, like sort of like, like, uh, you know, signature, like, you know, high end reality TV, you know, and it's like, they very much are about, making it keeping it real you know so so they didn't they didn't give us any coaching which was fine for me so get there and basically and i immediately fucked it up like because what (laughs) i had failed i knew i had the producers on my side and like everybody else on the show was really nice which became a problem for me having positioned myself as the the um the antagonist there was nobody worth antagonizing Mm. You know, like they want, you know, these shows thrive on people fighting with each other, but everybody was so nice, you know, and we were all kind of like in the same boat and we were all kind of nervous and scared and it's traumatizing, you know, when you make friends with somebody and then you have to watch them struggle and be humiliated and then, and then removed Mm -hmm. all that type of stuff hit me in a way I wasn't prepared for. And also because I was so focused on my performance that I wasn't really thinking about the work that I was making, like the first time we got, we got the first challenge was to, we, they took us into this gallery inside the Brooklyn museum and they have all this terrible thrift store art hanging up. And the idea was like, you're going to take some of this kitschy work and um, make it and, and then turn it and elevate it. Right. And they had this black light painting of Frank Frazetta's interpretation of Gandalf Mm -hmm. from the, the Lord of the Rings cartoon. So I snatched that off the wall and not really thinking how little time, because you have like a day, a day, Mm -hmm. like you have like about a 14 hour day and then a few hours the next day. And then you got to hang it on the wall and they're going to judge it. And I'm like, I'm going to make this resin figure. And I had this whole thing, you know, like I, and I like my process, I wanted to show them the toy process. Yeah. You know, so with the molds and all that crap, which didn't even really make it in the cut. And like, I didn't plan it out right. And the piece looked like crap, you know, or it just didn't come out right. I don't know why I didn't just make a blister carded figure. I wanted to make something a little bit like a diorama and all this shit. And it just couldn't do it. And what I had failed to consider is that all the smoke that's being blown up my ass by the producers and everything like that has nothing to do with the judges of the show. You know, like they don't interfere with any of that. Yeah. And unfortunately for me, there was a one Mr. Jerry Saltz, who was the the main judge. I mean, there yeah. was Jerry Saltz, this other guy named Bill Powers, who was also kind of a jerk, and um, China Chow, who was very nice and and were the judges. And then they would have a rotating guest judge. And I didn't really know much about Jerry Saltz or anything like that. But like cute, kitschy, little geeky things that come out of the world that we know ain't his bag. And like I hadn't realized that and I didn't even give it any thought. I just made what I felt like making. I wasn't even I didn't even kind of forgot that we were going to even be judged on this. I was having so much fun just being on camera and shooting the shit with everybody and making friends and, you know, doing my little shtick that I forgot to think about. Oh, wait a minute. This is a competition. Yeah. You know, and then I also read later on in his blog, because when the show was airing, he blogged about it. 
And he basically said up from the beginning, when I heard that there was a person named the Suck Lord on the show, my number one priority was to, to, to get him off the show as quickly as possible. What the fuck, you know, like yeah. he already didn't, he was already against me and I gave him the ammunition to, 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 you know, to, to give it to me because I, I didn't make good shit. It, I, I was very bad at planning, planning it out. I'm not, I can't just draw a picture, you know, it's like, I'm a, I produce artwork and there's an industrial side to it. And it's just like, I had a real hard time translating this and he gave me the business. And on the first, fortunately it was the first episode and like I had enough to say about Gandalf and what this means. I was able to ring out some sort of purpose to it. And thankfully, there was somebody there that made an even bigger turkey than I did. And the first guest was Mary Ellen Mark, who's deceased now, but she's a famous photographer. And somehow through all of all of that, she she got me, mm -hmm. you know, and she defended me. And she, it was and they out of respect for her, they they chose not to eliminate me. And then kept going it was a relentless relentless fucking uh schedule you know as soon as that was over like you you know you do the crit right it was basically you'd work all day then you'd go home late sleep and we we're all sequestered you know we're all in this we're all staying in this hotel they took mm -hmm. our phones we weren't allowed to call people we weren't allowed to go on the internet nothing mm -hmm. you know so we're just living in this hermetic you know um bubble and and then the next morning they get us up and it's like, as soon as you wake up, the cameras are in the room, you know, filming you fucking wiping your ass or whatever. And just like every little detail, everything that's going on is being recorded and all the alcohol you could possibly drink is available. There we go. And, and it's just every day, like there was a day off once or twice, you know, to like do laundry and just like do catch up interviews because they're interviewing you while this is all going on you know and like they'll pull you off the out of the studio and sit you down and talk to you for an hour because they want every person on the show to narrate every detail of what's going on because they use that stuff to cut to cut the narratives together and so over time i'm getting tired and i'm getting too drunk and like showing up hung over to this shit i fucking regret that so much that i just didn't have the discipline to control myself and i managed to like sort of wiggle through like the next couple of contests we did like some kinetic art shit and and some and a pop art challenge which i thought i made some cool shit for but like i didn't the best i could do is like i wasn't up for the for the critique or the crit like because at the end of the every you hang the shit up they have a little party ron english was at one of the parties before i met him Nice. which was kind of interesting and um and then and then they uh you know then they tell you who the winners are like every person has to explain their shit and then and then they have the elimination and it takes hours and hours and hours and hours because they have all these cameras that they got to move and like you're sitting around and like by the time you get home you're beat and so i got i got exhausted and then 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 my facade cracked because like on the fourth episode uh, they introduced a ch children into it, you know, uh, like they like, yeah, that's your like, weakness. Well, I didn't know it was going to be my weakness at the time. And I somehow intuitively knew that something like this was going to happen. But we go into the studio one day to hear what the new challenge is going to be. And this is the one where Sarah Jessica Parker was the guest judge. And so she was there. And um, there's all these every person's workstation has a little child sitting there and there's this like nine-year-old girl there and like each child at my table and each child has um a piece of artwork that they created and that it's your job as the challenge is to like reinterpret that artwork and elevate it and make it better which on principle i was offended by that concept yeah you know what are you saying that like because they're a child that their artwork somehow needs a refining or whatever it's like yeah. her painting she made this painting of a tree with all these little creatures in it it was fine it was a nice painting by a child what what the fuck am i gonna do to this thing and then it just got discombobulated because then i realized like i i knew i knew that like i was vulnerable with the judges and that like i didn't really think that my artwork was landing and i knew that i couldn't come up with anything and i knew i had to make them happy but then I got all confused because I was just like, 
if I lose this challenge, is this kid going to get a feel a certain type of way about that? Like, is it, is that a loss for the child too? Is this kid going to yeah. feel bad? Or feel like a is that going to hurt their sense of themselves as an artist if I fail? I don't know if it would have or wouldn't have, but I just my whole fucking priorities change, and it's like I have to make something that makes this kid feel good about themselves, you know. And um, I don't know what the fuck possessed me, but I was going to make this sculpture. I was going to turn it into a sculpture and make like a diorama out of it. Me and the goddamn fucking dioramas all the time. So I sculpted this big tree and. And I and I was I took I did way too much, and I was gonna put all these little Star Wars figures because I had all these boxes of toys. So I was like painting these Wookies green and making them the little creatures that lived in the in the little nooks and crannies of the trees. And then unfortunately, I, I didn't plan my time out, and like by the time it was like an hour before it had to go down into the gallery, and it wasn't even painted. And I'm like, oh fuck, you know. So I slapped on this coat of orange and brown paint, and it just looked fucking awful it just looked fucking terrible you know and i'm like it's like they're counting down the minutes five minutes five minutes and i'm like hot gluing green chewbacca's into this fucking ugly piece of shit and and then they finally wheel it out into the gallery and i'm like a mess i'm like about to, i'm on the verge of tears because i'm like this girl is gonna see this thing and hate it and hate me and like, I wasn't even thinking about the critique or the elimination or anything like all the fucking bravado and all that just went out the goddamn window. I don't know why. I guess yeah. I want, I don't, I'm not a father. I don't have children. I don't around children that much. So I didn't realize that all human beings have within themselves this sort of like package of emotions and instincts that just turn on when a child becomes your responsibility, Yeah, you know? And I was not prepared for any of that. And I didn't know what to do with it. And then I suddenly went from being this cheeky supervillain guy to this very sincere, emotional person. And that wasn't, that was, thank God, just enough to save me because Jerry Saltz was ready to destroy this fucking thing. And the only thing that saved me, this is where the, I mean, this is that I cried during the critique, you know, because I just, like, I, first of all, I got, fucking so i got mad because like they were being such dicks like everyone that went through this challenge felt a certain type of way you mm -hmm. know like uh, half the group was like all got we all got emotional for some reason maybe just because we were tired but just like you know just like all this childhood shit came up and everybody just got super vulnerable and then here come these fucking judges you know looking at all this work and not taking any of this into con and just tearing it apart and it just made me pissed off and my friend uh twos he was uh he was another contestant he's was and we made friends he was like a graffiti guy and he made an equally mediocre piece you know whatever and they were just tearing him apart and it was just like and it was just like and i just got mad at i just got fucking pissed about all of this shit and i gave this whole screed i don't i don't remember how much of this made the edit and i fucking accused them of a whole bunch of just being fucking not understanding you know like because he was he, this is where he gave me the famous stop the star wars line you mm -hmm. know he had seen enough of my work to realize that it was incorporating appropriated pop culture iconography and he was like fuck that shit this isn't art because of that you know stop the star wars and if i see it again i'm gonna get medieval on your ass and that was the, the moment i lost the game not because he said that but because I was vulnerable, not only I was emotionally vulnerable, but um, because I, because I agreed with that, you know, it's like, that was my, sh that was my shit, you know, that was my shit. Like if he was, and, and, and yet on the other hand, as an artist, that was always a thing in the back of my mind that I was worried about. It's like, is my work good or do people just like it because it's Boba Fett? You know, like, am I really doing anything here or, or people just like my shit because it's fake Star Wars stuff and it's funny. And that's always, always, always been something that's like created doubt in my mind about my, my, my artwork and my creativity. And he either instinctively figured that out or just landed on it coincidentally. Yeah. And I had no defenses for it. And he just shot that fucking arrow and boom. And instead of saying, fuck you, this is what I do. If you don't like it, you can kick me off right now. I said, yes, sir. 
because a like i said it was just a vulnerability and i didn't want to get kicked off the show to be honest with you i knew that no matter what happens like every second of screen time that i'm getting here is is worth a lot mm -hmm. you know and who knows when i'm going to be on tv again so i wanted to stretch it out and i think but i think because i made that that sort of like uh compromise with my with 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 myself and with just with my own standards that uh i had already i had surrendered at that point and i didn't get eliminated he eliminated they eliminated my friend twos on that episode and that hurt too and then we're there till like 2 30 in the morning filming this crap right and i'm getting fucking wasted and then you know you don't know what's going to happen the following day we get back to the thing every i'm upset about a whole bunch of shit i had no time to think about this or process this stuff and then at 5 30 in the fucking morning Simone de Puri comes and wakes us up and drives us out to the place where they print the New York Times out in Queens and they give us a new challenge. And I am not ready. I'm going on three hours of sleep. I'm hungover. I just w got put through the ringer emotionally. And now I just have to fucking get my shit together and do something completely different and unrelated. Couldn't do it. And I decided I'm not going to make my, my work the way I usually make it. I'm going to try to please the judges. And then it went, it was shit. I made shit. And like, I'm like, why am I still here? I should have left. I should have got kicked off the show and didn't happen. And then, so I made a terrible piece and the same thing happened. And I was on the bottom again. And I was there till fucking two o'clock in the morning getting drunk. And fortunately my other friend, Bayate had made something that was just slightly worse than what I had made. And he mm -hmm. got eliminated and that was, and then, and then like, and then the next day it's like, okay, you're going out to Brooklyn and now you're a street artist. And I still torture myself over this because everybody was kind of rooting for me, you know, not, maybe not the, not the villains, but like everybody else, the producers, the China Chow, like Simone de Puri, the other contestants wanted me to do to, not to lose, you know, in a pathetic, miserable way. And everyone knew I was struggling and this should have been a fucking no brainer. You know, I'm from New York, you know, I, yeah. I you know, I, I'm in that world. Like I should be able to ace this. Right. And they paired me up with this other woman um, named Sarah Kay. It was very nice. Completely different type of artist. It was like a team challenge. And I have no, I, I have no ideas. I have no ideas. I can't think of anything. I'm just bereft of, I, I'm demoralized. I, 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 I don't, I've lost track of, I lost the fucking narrative. And wound up just making a mediocre, compromising piece that had nothing to do with my style. And... I had the worst fucking critique of my life because I'm standing there. I didn't think the piece was that successful. It was like we took this paper on the wall and we made this thing that looked like a maze and glued some wooden sticks to it. And it just didn't look like anything. And I, and like, and I was just so dial. I was so like checked out with, the, with what we were doing. I wasn't even thinking of anything. And the guest judge was Lee Quinones who is famous old school graffiti artist. He was yeah. one of the main protagonists in a uh, wild style and, um, you know, a New York legend and like, I'm the New York guy, you know, and here I am standing there having to defend this piece that I thought was indefensible, you know, and what, what happened was, and this, this created so much trauma for me is that, they always let the guest judge go first when they, when it's time to tear down the bad work. Yeah. You know, Jesus. And so I'm standing there and I had some flimsy defense ready, but what I had failed to notice is that there was already some graffiti on the wall that they gave us. They had like eat, there was four teams and each team had a, a wall, like this big, like 10 foot by something 20 by 10 foot wall in, in Brooklyn in Dumbo, Brooklyn. And there was a couple of tags on the wall and the, the woman that I was working with, not, and it wasn't her fault because she didn't know she'd sort of covered up one of the tags with, with the, with the paper that we were putting on the wall. And I, I didn't even really notice that I was so caught up in everything. I didn't really notice. And so I'm standing there and the piece is on the wall and Lee looks right at me and says, yo, why'd you go over that tag? And I'm like, Oh fuck. Like I'm a toy, I just, and I was like, you don't do that in graffiti. Yeah. You know, that's beef in graffiti. If somebody fucks, if you 
go over another writer's shit, that's a violation, you know, and that's, and then that, and then it's going to be some retaliation. And it's just like, and as soon as he said that, it was just, I was fucking done. I was like, my, I cannot go back to New York after this. I have just, it was not only that was such a bad thing that I went over someone's tag. It's just like, I should have known that. I should have caught that. Yeah. I shouldn't be standing there caught out there like that, you know, looking like a sucker on TV, being the New York, cool New York street, Lower East Side guy. Thank God that didn't make it into the edit. But, you know, I, I gave some weak, flimsy defense and then like they just tore the whole piece down and I couldn't just, I couldn't, I had no defense. And I guess they would just got sick of me and it was my turn to go and I got eliminated. And, you know, got kicked off the show. And then for the six months, there's like six months between when if when it wraps and when it and when it airs. And that you're not supposed to talk about it. So mm. I'm just like, I got six months to live. And then and then then that show's gonna come on. All my friends are gonna start rooting for me, and then I'm gonna suffer this just complete defeat of my credibility. I'm going to be destroyed on television and yeah. my career will be over. And I couldn't tell anybody and I had to keep it to myself for fucking six months. And I'm just like falling apart inside, just thinking like everything I created just got destroyed there. I mean, I guess I must've ultimately none of this turned out to be true, but in my mind it was, and especially I couldn't talk about it. I just like, it just festered in there. And then like around, you know, a month before the show is going to come on, they start doing the commercials and the promo promos. And I'm seeing myself on TV and on commercials and everybody's hearing about it. And everybody in the toy community is like, oh, this is great. You know, finally, one of our people is like really getting the recognition they deserve. And oh, I bet you killed it on that show. You probably win. Right. And everyone was like, yeah, I can't wait to see this. And like the first couple of episodes finally come out. And like, even though I wasn't like killing it, you know, with the judges, like the way it was edited, I came across very sympathetically and it was working for me. And I was, you know, getting all this press and all this attention and yeah. sales and all this shit. And I'm just like quietly just dreading this when the hammer's going to fucking drop. And then, and I, and I almost had a fucking nervous breakdown, you know, because like, it was like, I'm watching the complete, like, deconstruction of a, of a self, you know, like this whole self that I created is getting torn apart. And there's, and, and they find that there's nothing under there, but just like a sad, pathetic man, you know? And, but to my surprise, when, when the episode with the little kid came out, everybody liked that one. Yeah. That's when people started liking me more, you know? And, and, and then I noticed on every TV show that I've ever been on, it's the same arc. Here's a guy that seems like this kind of jerk and we can't figure him out. He's got this fucking attitude and then something humanizing happens and then it helps you understand why he had that attitude in the first place. And then you, and then you wind up liking him. And I, and I didn't, even on the dating game, you know, it came out like a fucking, you know, smarmy asshole and wound up getting a big, ah, you know, at the end, you know, yeah. cause I said something revealing. I was like, I didn't even plan this out. So Nothing bad actually happened. You know, by the time I got eliminated, thank God they left that little piece about the graffiti tag off there. And I guess somebody in the editing room must have liked me because they did the best they could to make it look like an injustice that I got kicked off the show. And one thing Jerry Salt said, you know, that made sense is like um, every artist should experience some sort of great public failure you know, to inoculate yourself against self-doubt and criticism. And it was like, so it worked out great. Nobody gave a shit about me losing. No one gave a fuck. All my anxieties were for nothing. And then I had a whole street art campaign ready to go where I just put up these posters all over the city, just like the suck word is a fraud, you know, and I just owned it, you know, I just fucking yeah. owned it. And then he made a whole bunch of action figures about it, sold a shitload of them. I made an action, action figures of Jerry Saltz and all that shit. I, I managed to milk the fuck out of it forever. And, or not forever, for a long period of time and everything was fucking fine. And then, um, I was like convinced that now life is going to be different. Everything's going to be different now. 
and like I'm on the way up and like I don't have to make these stupid fucking toys anymore and I'm going to be a TV star and it's like the following year I got offered another show on Bravo as a as like a plot device for this show called Gallery Girl mm -hmm. which was just like have you ever watched that or no I've never heard of it it, it's, it's this ridiculous show that they made. I guess what they were attempting to do was do this thing like the the, the real li real lives of the Lower East Side. So it's basically like they find these like privileged white girls yeah. that want to work in the art world. And yeah. they follow them around as they try to get hired by art galleries or run their own art gallery or whatever. And I guess this when they were making the show, they were still kind of buzzing on the on work of art, which ultimately got canceled because... Uh, because uh didn't get good ratings but like it, it really seemed like bravo wanted to do something with me mm -hmm. you know because i was seemed to be the breakout star you know every every reality show new reality show cast always has this breakout star thing and and sarah jessica parker was jerking my dick on on andy cohen's show i got to go on andy cohen's show and shill my toys and then i got invited to be on the show called gallery girl and it was a great opportunity to sort of like re reburnish my image because there was these two girls that had this gallery a few blocks from my studio and i guess they were running out of story for these girls you know like they weren't doing anything and they had no material except that the gallery wasn't making any money and they were going broke so they're just like they fudged it a little bit to sort of strongly convince them that maybe they should ask some guy named the suck lord you know, who just got on the cover of the fucking Village Voice because yeah. of the TV show um, to, to, to do a show there. So they came to my studio and we came up with this whole thing and they were like, this is like during Occupy Wall Street and we were going to do this thing it was going to be like Occupy Wall Street meets Transformers. And, <laughs> you know, the, and then we did this whole thing in the, in the gallery. This is also on my website if you want to watch it. I took the episode and I chopped out all the parts that I wasn't in and just, and just made it, you know the stuck the suck word story yeah and it's fucking hilarious and again it's the same thing these two girls are very dubious about letting this sort of sleazy grungy little you know street rat toy weirdo into their very nice fancy space to do act transformers stuff and pack it with geeks what the fuck and then i made them several thousand dollars and they paid their rent and they paid their rent. And so at the end of the episode, they wound up loving me. And that was that. And then I was like, okay, great. Then all these other offers started coming in. And I signed a development deal with this television, other television network. And they were going to do a suck board vehicle and like put all this effort into it. And then, and like thought like, okay, that's it. I'm a TV star now. Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to just ride this out and fuck toys and fuck everybody and I don't want to ever touch a fucking action figure again for the rest of my life. And then um the deal got taken away. I got rugged for whatever reason they decided they didn't want to spend any money on it. After I signed the deal and they gassed me up and told me, you know, I had this whole manifesto on their website about we stick by our partners and blah 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 for some reason they just inexplicable reason they decided to not make my show or not develop my show because they wanted to make a show about football. So always and then, football. Yeah. And then so it's like in the beginning of 2013 and like I had invested so much of myself into this idea that I was going to be a TV star and that I was going to, you know, finally get some money and finally like go somewhere in life. And, uh, and then it dried up. And then it's so like a year after the, everything had aired people forgot about it you know yeah nobody was talking about it the show wasn't playing anymore life went on and i was standing there with nothing and i had to go back to the toy game and i just couldn't like i would even even though i felt like i had gotten away with and avoided like a huge personal catastrophe i never really got over the fact that my mask had been removed you know uh, yeah. metaphorically speaking let's talk about so something that's interesting is you've used the word trauma twice so which to have uh to go in as a super villain and all of a sudden people realize or have the potential to realize that that's not you're not that super villain anymore but then also to have people 
you there's this dichotomy right um because on the back of your action figures it's you're an asshole for buying this and like uh here's my box of garbage and this is my shit you own it now that type of stuff but then when people like jerry are looking at you and trying to destroy you and they're calling your stuff shit like why does it what is that can you explain that because for you it's shit for them, when they call it shit, it's like, oh, that's trauma now. Well, no, I mean, this is a great question. I mean, for me, it was always ironic because I knew I made things that on the surface looked crappy. Yeah. But I, but the re, we are an asshole for buying this was always meant to be an inside joke, you know, because yeah. I actually really, really appreciated when people bought it. It was just more like, if you can read that and laugh at it, you yeah. get what I'm trying to say here is that inside of this like seemingly crappy looking action figure, it's actually wrought and infused with personal meaning and commentary and context and content that transcends, at least this is my imagination, transcends the piece itself. The piece itself is almost just like a suggestion of a greater you know, idea and concept. And it's like, the thing is, in that case, I'm in control there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, I'm dictating. This is what it looks like. This is how you're going to receive it. I'm in. I'm in charge. You know, and that, and I'm, and I'm, and the power sits with me. You know, and that was all that had been hard wrought to be able to do that because you know, if you've listened to the other episodes of this show, I was a vulnerable person as a child, and it took me a long time to build up this sort of armor around myself where I could actually pull something like that off. You know, where I actually had the confidence to like provoke people and to like take a stand and do something controversial and act as a lightning rod and be able to weather it and master it and use it for my own nefarious purposes and enrich myself off of it. That worked for me because I had control of it and you only saw the vulnerabilities if I wanted you to. And what unnerved me or unmanned me about being on the show is like I had lost that control. You know, like I was showing, I was losing my power or losing control of the narrative and I couldn't stop it. And like, and that was what was disturbing to me, you know, that like I was like, it was being taken from me or like that, like it was slipping away and I, I, I wasn't, the story and the events were getting ahead of my mastery, you know, and it's happening in public. And now, now that the armor is gone, my enemies have a clean shot at me. And it was just like, ah, it was just like, I just felt naked. Yeah. You know, I just felt naked on TV and like I was able to claw it back and rebuild it, you know, because fortunately it isn't a, it isn't really a persona. It's just, it's just the end product of having an inta- a strong and healthy ego, mm-hmm. you know, that allows me to do that self. I never, ever considered my persona to really be a persona. Like Stephen Colbert, when he do- when he did his original show, that was a persona. That's an act that you turn on and you're sort of playing a different character. For me, it's just like, this is just me being who I really want to be. Yeah. I'm not really acting here. I'm just like, I've created a venue for me to be able to just like be my raw unvarnished self and just like, con- but so losing that control was what I, f- what felt traumatic to me. And I felt like all, everything I had built up had been destroyed and that it wasn't by my design and it stressed me the fuck out because all my you know i'm very sensitive and vulnerable and emotional and i felt like that had all been laid bare and it was and it was it was uh i didn't like it yeah (laughs) and then as you talk about building this armor and then things were out of your control and being stripped from you it seems like because we've talked about um star wars and action figures like all through the episodes And like when you were a kid, that was your shit. Like you knew action figures and then growing up, you kept returning. And so when that asshole says like, stop this Star Wars shit, is that like not only a crack in the armor, but that's like peeling it open as well? Well, I mean, maybe. I I think it was just, like I said before, I always was completely unsure if that somewhere underneath all of it, I was, I was a fraud and that it wasn't like that didn't. That kind of brought tears to my eyes right there. That's a, that's a statement that is like that everyone needs to live by. Sometimes I believe like we go through life trying to figure out, are we a fraud? Right. 
Yeah, I mean, it's imposter syndrome. I think every creative person goes through that. In fact, it's the undoing of, of a lot of people. Yeah. You know, I mean, I wonder why artists are so unwell most of the time is just because you have this whole extra thing that you have to worry about. And it's like feels beyond, you know, beyond your control. And it's like so contingent on validation from others, yeah. you know, and sometimes people don't get it. And sometimes they get all the validation in the world, but they can't figure out how to self-validate. And and it's like sometimes you get that, you know, it uh, if people are worshiping you as a great genius and then you yourself feel like a miserable piece of shit. That 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 sort of uh, dissonance between your public self and your private self can really fuck you up. But so I don't think saying stop the Star Wars um disarmed me. I was already disarmed because I felt like just being with that kid just like made me forget you know, just change my priorities. And then he was able to just, you know, lob, lob all this other shit against me. And just like, I had no, it wasn't bounced. There was no armor for it to bounce off of. So, uh, but I got my revenge on Jerry Sauls many, many times over. You know, I have made so much money satirizing yeah. him and making action figures. I mean, off camera, he's a fine guy. You know, he was cool with me making figures of every, making endless action figures of him and playing with his image. And he didn't ask for anything in return. He would, he signed a bunch of the packaging that I made. He never fully understood what I was doing. I mean, I think to this day, he still doesn't really get action figures, but every once in a while, when he's having a slow news day, he'll post something I did of him. And I always wind up getting like an extra thousand followers or whatever. So it's fine. I won. I won. I ultimately, I, I won. But, uh, but nevertheless, it's just like, I did have to regress, you know, because like after, you know, when I didn't, when, when my TV career failed to launch, I had to go back to doing the same old thing, but I wasn't the same person anymore. Right. You know, it just like felt like that process had changed and I couldn't just go back and turn it on again. Like I felt like too much had happened that, that like I've already revealed myself and i just don't feel it i can't bring i can't feel it and then like and then a bunch of other shitty things happen like i told you like this is like me and dove tried to scale the business and it didn't work and we wound up making like a lot of product that didn't resonate and didn't sell and i fell on some hard times financially and then guys like killer bootlegs were coming in and you know mixing shit up and like i was like at a low point in my creativity and these guys were like really uh taking away my audience and taking mm -hmm. away my collectors. And I was just like one thing after another, you know, and then I lost my studio, lost my relationship. And just like, I was just like sort of out, out there, you know, and I wound up moving into another studio, which was significantly more expensive and I'm still there now and it's still expensive. <laughs> it's like, I'm still living in this sort of post work of art world where it's just like, you know, the money part got harder because my overhead went up and then, right around that time when like I started to really get nervous um, about, about the future, I heard this podcast called um, Adventures in Design. Do you know that? Yep. And uh, Huck Gee was on it. Is it Huck Gee or Huck G? Huck G, I think. Huck G. And we all know who he is. I mean, he was a big time kid robot guy, mm -hmm. you know, and he was sweeping the floor with all his custom dunnies and monies and he was just like always winning all the designer toy awards. I've never won a single fucking thing in my life, but, um, you know, he's getting all these accolades. And, you know, when I was in the, in the throes of my poverty and my, my anger and my frustration and my sort of disillusionment from not getting a TV career and just like, and then he goes on this podcast and he just confesses, I owe a quarter million dollars in taxes and I'm broke and I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing and I'm fuck. fucked. And like, I felt bad for him, but I'm like, I appreciated that he was willing to reveal that. Yeah. And then, and that, you know, it was just like, you know, a cautionary tale for other creatives, you know, like don't, don't mistake the image for what's going on behind the scene. And then I really leaned into that and I started making myself much more vulnerable you know, like I sort of stopped trying to be a supervillain and I started my own podcast called the suck hour where I just like put all my dirty laundry out there and I processed my feelings and I went through all this shit and I just sort of changed my, my, my approach and my artwork became less about, um, 
the suck lord and it yeah. came be more about like action figures like i found a new passion you know just trying to figure out like all right i'm stuck making action figures like what can i do with them and how do i take the, the focus off myself and just sort of play with the medium and i and i <laughs> spent you know like 10 years like just figuring new things out and trying different stuff and sort of trying to push push the medium i mean now you could see many of my innovations have been appropriated by many many people yeah. you know i mean i mean just the whole concept of just like anything can be an action figure and you know like what can you use what can you say with it and um and whatever i i mean is is it might not have been as sexy but that's that's where that's where i that's where i wound up and now it seems like something's gonna change again because i did have one more uh television encounter and that was when i got cast on the, the goldbergs yeah. and that was dis decidedly different because it wasn't um it wasn't a reality show it was a scripted show and apparently adam goldberg the guy that created that show um is a big fan of bootleg toys and he mm -hmm. collects a lot of them and he always whenever he gets the opportunity to slip them into the background you know the show takes place in like the 80s so um he uh he always likes to like i guess dead greedy got like his beastie droids figure in there and you know which made his life and that stuff and so i guess he thought well it's pretty funny putting all these easter eggs in the show why don't we just cram in the ultimate easter egg and put a suck lord himself in there so i had a cameo it was like a 30 second scene it's like a, a a disgruntled and spiteful toys r us employee yeah and that was so great you know i love being on set and just it's so fun to do that shit and um too bad it was only for that one day but it's great because i still get royalty checks for that you don't get paid to be on reality tv okay like, didn't get paid to be on work of art and there's no no royalties but because if it's a scripted show you do i had to join sag to get to get on there so every like three or four months i get like a check for like 16 dollars or there we go or whatever it was so, funny because it had a little bit whoever scripted it i don't fucking know but it had your personality or what i envisioned you saying because i think it was around rock lords yeah and you were like in the show it was like oh you should get one of these and the kid was like yeah oh, yeah i'll take him you're like too fucking bad i bought them all or something like that and it's yeah. just something i envisioned you saying well he cast me as a as a villain which i appreciated that because yeah i mean it's just been revealed and this has always been the challenge you know in the last decade since i was on that show is just like how to really square my 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 the way i identify as a villain with like how i actually am as a person and it's it's never it hasn't always been like intellectually coherent and you know I, I i was really hoping that the book of boba fett would would give me some clues yeah and it did believe it or not even though i thought the show as a whole was really bad it, it had an it had enough material in there to help to to to, to sustain the the suck lord mythology and how you know, it's possible to remain a, a, a villain character, but still grow, you know, and still be sympathetic and relatable because the really only reason I ever wanted to be a super villain in the first place is because I felt vulnerable and I felt vulnerable to hurts. I felt like I had been hurt and I felt like I didn't have quite the tools to assert myself in a very aggressive and callous and unforgiving world. And I figured like, going out into this world as a as a as a gentle kind soul ain't gonna work and like i need to build this part of myself up and and i did and then and then when it when it got re removed you know i didn't know if i could go back to it but you can because if you really think about it look at a guy like dr doom right yeah he loses all the time the villains always lose and yet they never, and then they double down on it and come back and with a better scheme or a better plan. And, you know, it's like, as long as I'm going to be a person out here trying to do capitalism and at the same time, like, per, pursue like a, a ridiculous creative vision, you know, I, ha I have to be that person because it's, 
otherwise or else I'll not I'm not gonna make it. So seeing Boba Fett kind of get in touch with a part of himself that he didn't know was there that was undeveloped and losing his armor yeah. and having to walk around unarmored for a long time and having to just like play by the rules of the world as a regular guy. You know, when he says that, when she's like, why don't you go and just t- ask for your ship back? And he's like, I'm more persuasive with my armor, mm-hmm. you know? And like, if I just go in there like this, I'm nobody. And I, I felt, I felt that, you know, and I understood why he needed the armor and how it's not a crutch and how he's just sort of had a different relationship with the armor where he is now okay taking off the helmet and stuff like that and how he's still more than willing to just exact revenge violent revenge on people that wrong him but it's like he sort of became you know and like the whole part was like you know where he you know you can only go so far without a tribe Thing, all of those things seem to be things that I that I need to learn and grow in, you know, just being this one man show and just like thinking you've got everything figured out and cutting yourself off and making yourself impervious only gets you so far. And so just like being able to like walk that line where it's like, I'm going to still be the criminal boss, but I'm going to be like a decent criminal boss. Yeah. You know, I got something out of that. And also just this whole thing in the back of the chamber, because like, you know, like all this vulnerability shit has been good for me you know if i've gone to therapy i've let people see my stuff my my weaknesses and like i've you know i've spent all this time sleeping and doing doing self-care and mental health and therapy and all this crap and and like after a while it's like all right you got to get out of the back the tank now and put on your helmet and get into the action again it's like if you're not going to keep going then then stay there but if you're going to keep going then go You know, and so like I was able to extract enough of that from the show to like keep my 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 suck word persona going for a little bit longer. And now I guess the bear, you know, the real question is like, what you know, what what now? You know, like what now? Yeah, you know, I I thought I always loved hearing you compare yourself to Boba Fett, Um, and. Uh, as I watched it, I mean, regardless of how I felt about it, it is what it is. But um, as I watched it, I like as he gets his armor back and he goes into the city, he's like uh, putting these fires out all over the city, getting shit in order, ma- trying to just fucking maintain what's happening. And that's as we've gone through your story up until this point what it feels like as that portion of the story in the book of Boba Fett like personifies or is a perfect example of what you kind of went through and now we're waiting for season two like you 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 got this armor back you started learning like shit I shouldn't have like done certain things you've put out these fires and now you're just maintaining this empire of what you're trying to do and now we're just sitting and waiting for like, okay, what does book two fucking look like for you? That's a great question. And I think we sort of uh, sketched this out that we were going to, that was going to be like the last episode. Yep. So I think um, we'll definitely cover that because something definitely needs to change and it's going to change whether I want it to or not. And just maintaining isn't a story. No. And in a lot of ways, I do kind of feel like I'm there. I'm at that point with my figure making Mm -hmm. and I could maintain it forever, but I don't find it interesting. And I don't think the audience really finds it all that interesting. So, you know, like if you really want to keep going and you really want there to be a, 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 a season two, you get, you better get some good writers in there. Well, here, here's a fear. I mean, you're older, you got more wisdom, a fear that was like bred into me when I was younger. Have you ever heard of the book Waiting for Godot? Of course. Yeah. It's and, a play. Yeah. So we were, we were forced to read this, the, the play over and over again, and I couldn't understand why. And then finally, a teacher of mine said, it's the play where nothing happens twice. Don't let your life be that. And so I think you've got a good point like maintaining no longer is a good story what happens now 
Right. And I think, I mean, it's just interesting that you bring that up because in a way it's just like, there's a path of obviously the two protagonists, there's a passivity there. You know, they are not, there's no act. They're not taking action. They're waiting to react to something that never happens. And if you want to, if you, I mean, that's what this, like, you know, fortune favors the bold, as they say, you know, like you got to get off the goddamn bench and go find fucking Godot if it's that important to you, you know, instead of just waiting for him to show up. Right. That, that is what the play is about. Right. There's more yeah. to it. But yeah, I for I for I forgot what it was about. I hated it when I read it. I found it so boring. But, <laughs> uh, you know, well, what, let's just unpack that for a minute. Nothing happens twice. What is that? What do you mean? So like. The, what are the two instances of nothing happening? Like there wasn't, uh, there's not like a rise and fall. There's not a huge, like the, the, nothing comes from it. Like if the play didn't exist, like if act two didn't exist, you wouldn't miss out on act one. Right. And so I think, I don't know, like one of my favorite movies, it, it goes into the, one of my favorite movies of all time is called The Quarrel. And the entire movie is just a conversation between two people nothing is resolved nothing is started like it's just but the there is a beauty in the steadiness of it and so i think that i don't know i mean the thing is some of this stuff doesn't really have an answer yeah. you know like talking about god you're never going to come to a definitive conclusion that you right. can live by for the rest of your life it's a the process of asking the questions is the thing Right. You know, and it's just like, it's never going to be solved. I mean, and I guess I'm fortunate in life that I've, it, it feels like I'm in a story, you know, and that like it, nothing, nothing really truly works, you know, like they're, oh, we always have to do something else. There always has to be more. There always has to be more, you know, you always has to, you don't come to any definitive things. Like, okay, this is the thing now. And it's, uh, it's solved, you know, it just keeps going and going and going and then hopefully hopefully it has some sort of you could take something away from it but i don't know we'll we'll see we'll see like i get i get depressed sometimes when like i feel like my my life interesting things happen to me and i'm like the only person there and mm -hmm. i'm like wow this should have been on tv you know or this would have been such an interesting story or what are the, what a spectacle i just participated in and i didn't record any of it fuck 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 that sucks and then i realized that i'm the audience at the end of the day you are the writer and the reader of your life you know and like it, at the end of the day i think like what the, the, what we're able to communicate to other people is just a a filtered fragment of what is really there and you just can't, you just can't like being an artist, being a creative person. You're lucky if you get one tenth of your vision out to one tenth of the people, you know, yeah. and it's just like, and everything else is just like, it's lost. It's lost to the, you know, to history and all it just goes in the Akashic records and no one sees it and no one knows about it. And while I'm having these moments, I'm just like, well, I'm here mm -hmm. and I'm not going to take ruin this moment for myself because I don't have an audience. I'll be the audience. And this is awesome. You know, and this is awesome. You know, the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time alone. And that to me has been one of the greatest, like, gifts that I've sort of uncovered in myself in my mid middle life is that uh, how content I am to be alone with my own thoughts, and how I never get bored. And I can always entertain myself with some activity or just, I could just sit there and stare at the wall and the shit going on in my head is endlessly fascinating. You know, a lot of, a lot of people got fucked up during COVID, you know, because suddenly like all the externals were taken away yeah. and then they were just had to contend what was going on inside of themselves and be alone and be in their own solitude. And a lot of people couldn't handle it. And I was like, quite relieved to find that that part of myself was still intact and i feel like if you have that you can everything else can can happen after that you know you can you can move you can move from that it's like as long as your inner life is intact everything springs from the inside and everything comes from the subconscious everything starts as a thought before it becomes manifest in the world 
and you know making making the toys is a way is like a weird symbolic way of taking something intangible and making it tangible and having it represent a thought and now here it is in the world and another person can get that thought in their mind too just by this stupid piece of plastic Toys on Tap. Toys on Tap. Next episode. The next episode. It's great. It's amazing. You're going to want to listen to it. It's not right now, though. You're going to have to wait till the next episode to listen to it. Oh, when's that? The next one. Cool. Toys on Tap. Toys on Tap. The next one's going to be good, too. So stay tuned and, and, and listen to that. Toys on Tap. Awesome.